Perfect. I yeah, I think we can start now. The second talk of this session is by Lakshmi Priya, who is a student of uh, Professor Manjunath Krishnapur. Lakshmi Priya, so okay. we'll focus on nodal yeah. sets of Gaussian Laplace eigenfunctions. Um, maybe you can start. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful opportunity. I'll be talking about uh, nodal sets of uh, Gaussian Laplace eigenfunctions. Uh, so the aim in this talk is uh, to provide an overview of uh, this area. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, progress in this area in the recent past. So I wish to cover a few of uh, what has been done. Oh. Okay, so uh, let me start with uh, uh, the definitions of a few of the terms which appear in the title. So what is a nodal set? Uh, for a real valued function uh, defined on a manifold, uh, the nodal set is just the zero set of the function. Uh, by a nodal component, we mean a connected component of the zero set. And uh, a nodal domain is just a connected component of, uh... okay, sorry. Yeah, a nodal domain is just a connected component of uh, the complement of the zero set. So, uh, in the, so let me explain what these are with the help of uh, say one of these pictures. So in this picture, we have a real valued function defined on R2, and uh, this is the nodal portrait of the function. Uh, so the green region is where the function takes uh, positive values and the white region is where the function takes uh, negative values. And uh, the interface between these two regions is where the function vanishes. And uh, so the interface is the zero set of the function or the nodal set. Uh, in this case, uh, the dimension of the manifold is two. So if uh, the function is smooth and uh, there are no singular zeros for the function, uh, it follows from implicit function theorem that uh, the zero set is going to be a smooth uh, one-dimensional subset of uh, R2. So in this case, it's going to be a collection of curves smooth curves. So uh, what is an example of a nodal component in this picture? So, uh, okay, uh, what's an example of a nodal domain? So this uh, white blob here is an example of a nodal domain and uh, its boundary, which is a simple closed curve is an example of a nodal component. I'll come back to these pictures in a bit. Okay, so uh, next let me uh, define what are uh, Laplace eigenfunctions. If we take a smooth Riemannian manifold, uh, we uh, we consider the Laplace Beltrami operator, which in local coordinates is uh, given in this form. So this is the analog of the usual Laplacian, which we know uh, in the Euclidean space. So we say that a real value uh, is an eigenvalue of the Laplacian if we can find a uh, non-trivial function which satisfies this uh, eigenvalue equation. Uh, such an f is called a uh, lambda eigenfunction uh, for the Laplacian. And it's a well-known fact that if uh, m is closed, uh, then the eigenvalues of the uh, Laplace Beltrami operator actually form a discrete set uh, with infinity being the only uh, accumulation point. So in this case, it is possible to enumerate uh, the eigenvalues in an increasing fashion like this. And uh, it's also possible to find an orthonormal basis for uh, L2 uh, consisting just of uh, these eigenfunctions. Okay, so uh, here, if we take lambda equals zero, what we get is a harmonic function. And we know that harmonic functions enjoy a lot of regularity properties. So uh, just like harmonic functions, uh, the Laplace eigenfunctions also have a lot of regularity properties. Uh, which can be seen by uh, uh, what is usually called harmonifying the uh, Laplace eigenfunction. So if you have a Laplace eigenfunction, uh, you can actually uh, consider this function capital F, which is uh, just uh, the product of uh, uh, the Laplace eigenfunction with this factor. So this becomes a harmonic function on the manifold M cross R. And uh, because uh, we know that harmonic functions have a lot of regularity. We can use uh, this to get uh, uh, regularity properties for the Laplace eigenfunction. 
So for a lambda Laplace eigenfunction, uh, one over square root lambda is called uh, the wavelength scale of the function. So this is special because at this scale, the function behaves like a harmonic function. Uh, so the elliptic estimates, which are known for the harmonic functions, uh, so analogous uh, estimates also hold for uh, lambda Laplace eigenfunctions at this scale, uh, which is what I have uh, indicated here. So these regularity properties of the uh, Laplace eigenfunctions also reflect on their nodal sets. So here are some uh, regularity of the uh, nodal sets of the Laplace eigenfunctions. Most of these uh, results are classical. Uh, so let me just uh, tell you what they are. So in the first two, uh, uh, in the first, for the first two properties, we require the manifold to be uh, closed, compact. So the first is uh, Kuran's nodal domain theorem. Uh, so if we have a lambda Laplace eigenfunction of the uh, Laplace, uh, lambda Laplace eigenfunction, then uh, this theorem gives an upper bound for the total number of nodal domains of such a function. So uh, the upper bound is in terms of the uh, multiplicities of the uh, eigenvalues, which are smaller than lambda. Uh, the second one, uh, which is, uh, Yao's conjecture, it has actually been uh, resolved for a huge class of uh, manifolds now. So this gives the precise asymptotics for the uh, growth of the uh, nodal volume. So in dimension two, uh, this says that uh, the uh, length of the nodal set grows like square root lambda. Okay, so uh, the next two properties hold for uh, any manifold. The next is the Faber-Cron. So Faber-Cron's inequality says that uh, if you take any um, lambda Laplace eigenfunction and look at any nodal domain of uh, this function, the volume of this is bounded below by uh, some constant which is uh, de which depends only on lambda. So uh, this just says that there can't be uh, nodal domains which are very small in terms of the volume or the area. And uh, finally, uh, the nodal set forms a C over square root lambda net on M. So what this means is uh, if lambda becomes larger and larger, uh, the nodal set uh, spreads throughout the manifold and it becomes uh, more denser uh, on the manifold. So uh, let's see, let's go back to the pictures we started with. So the first two pictures are uh, uh, the nodal portraits of uh, Laplace eigenfunctions. Uh, the first one is on R2, and the second one is on the sphere S2. So we see that there is a very stark difference between uh, these two pictures and uh, the third picture. Uh, the reason is that uh, the uh, regularity properties which we just discussed uh, manifest to give such a nice uh, regular structure for the uh, nodal set and the nodal domains, whereas uh, uh, th this is the nodal portrait of a function defined on S2. Uh, so what is this function? So this is something called the band limited function. Uh, so this is just a linear combination of uh, Laplace eigenfunctions whose uh, eigenvalues are close. So even if you take something which is very closely related to the uh, Laplace eigenfunction, we see that uh, the nodal set uh, loses all its regularity. All right. Okay, so although uh, these uh, nodal sets of the Laplace eigenfunctions are very regular, there's a lot of variability in their behavior and it is interesting to study the typical behavior. So what are the usual uh, questions which uh, people study about these uh, Laplace eigenfunctions? They are the total number of nodal domains, which I call the nodal domain or nodal component count in compact subsets of the manifold. Uh, and uh, we can also study the number of uh, nodal domains which have some special property, uh, which are specified in terms of the topology or volume or things like that. Um, and another important feature of uh, the uh, nodal set in two dimensions is the nodal length or the nodal volume in higher dimensions. So uh, yeah, because of this, it's interesting to randomize these Laplace eigenfunctions and study their typical behavior which is what we will do. 
And uh, in this talk, uh, I'll focus mainly on uh, the total count or and also a specialized uh, count of uh, nodal domains. Okay, so here are a few other motivations for uh, interest in this study. So these are two conjectures by the physicist uh, Berry. So uh, let's see the first one. Uh, it's called the random wave conjecture. So he conjectured that uh, the random plane wave, I'll say what this is in a bit. So this is a, a random Laplace eigenfunction on R2. I'll define this precisely in a few slides from now. So he conjectured that uh, this uh, random plane wave is a universal object which models Laplace eigenfunctions on a huge class of manifolds. So if we take uh, Laplace eigenfunctions uh, corresponding to high eigenvalues, in some sense, they resemble this uh, random object, which is the random plane wave. So it is interesting to study these, uh, uh, to, this, to study this particular object, random plane wave and other related uh, models. And uh, nextly, the uh, semi-classical eigenfunction hypothesis. So this is also a conjecture of uh, Berry. So he conjectured that if we take an orthonormal basis for L2 consisting of uh, Laplace eigenfunctions, uh, which are enumerated in such a way that uh, the corresponding eigenvalues are actually increasing, then we can find a density one subsequence uh, such that along this subsequence, the L2 mass almost equidistributes at the wavelength scale. Okay, so uh, this is what, uh, uh, this means. These are still conjectures, very, uh, uh, not much progress has been made on these conjectures. Okay, so uh, now let's come to uh, talking about uh, the nodal count. So what is the main challenge in studying uh, nodal component count? Uh, the main challenge is that it is a non-local quantity. So let me explain what it is uh, with the help of this picture. Suppose we have a real valued function on R2, and uh, let us look at uh, the uh, nodal set of this function in a large box. So assume that uh, these are parts of the nodal set, you know what the, how the nodal set looks like in just these two smaller uh, subregions of this uh, large box. So just from, uh, just by knowing how the nodal set uh, looks in these two uh, smaller boxes, it is impossible to say uh, the contribution of uh, these pieces to the total uh, nodal component count. Because uh, we need to know the entire picture of the nodal set in order to uh, say how much these pieces contribute to the uh, nodal component count. So as it turns out in this example, most of these pieces are actually part of the same uh, nodal component. So this is what I call a non-local non quantity. Uh, this is in stark contrast with what happens for the nodal length. So uh, when, if, you, if we want to find the nodal uh, length of this uh, function in this large box, it suffices to know the uh, nodal length of this function locally at every point because uh, you just, uh, it, it suffices to just add up all these uh, uh, nodal lengths in all these boxes to get the total nodal length in this large box. But clearly we can't do this uh, for in order to get uh, the total nodal count. Uh, but uh, what is uh, uh, what turns out to be useful for us is in most of the uh, random functions which we study, the nodal component count actually turns out to be a semi-local quantity. So this is something in between uh, the two extremes of being a local and a non-local quantity. So what do I mean by uh, semi-local quantity? Uh, this just means that uh, if I take, in this particular example, if I take these styling boxes to be uh, large enough, and if I uh, just count the number of nodal components in each of these boxes and sum them up, then this gives a very good approximation for the uh, total nodal count in this large box. So uh, it's not surprising that uh, semi-locality is uh, very crucial in our study of uh, nodal components because in most situations in probability, you will only be able to say something about uh, what happens locally, 
we then need to put together all this local information to get some uh, useful global information. So uh, let me illustrate uh, this with a very simple example. So suppose we have a smooth stationary Gaussian process on um, R2 uh, and uh, say we are, okay, so what is a, a stationary Gaussian process? It is a Gaussian process. So it is a random function. It is a special kind of a random function. It's a Gaussian process whose uh, distribution is invariant under translations. So uh, we want to uh, see if we can say something about uh, the expected number of uh, nodal components in this uh, box minus r, r square. So here NRF just denotes the number of nodal components in this uh, large box. Uh, this box is just minus r, r square. All right. Uh, so uh, one way to go about uh, uh, trying to understand this quantity is to uh, tile this uh, large box with uh, smaller boxes and uh, try to uh, uh, separately uh, sum up the uh, nodal components which uh, belong to uh, the smaller boxes or the ones which do not uh, belong to uh, any of these uh, smaller boxes and then somehow bound the number of uh, nodal components which do not belong to any of these smaller boxes. So uh, let's do this. So what we have is uh, we have this box minus r r square and we tile this with, uh, with boxes of length L. So we can write the total nodal count in this large box as the number of nodal components which are contained in at least one of these smaller tiling boxes uh, plus the number of uh, nodal components which are not contained in any of them. So uh, uh, these are the ones which are indicated in violet here are the ones contained in at least one of these smaller boxes. And we can lower bound uh, this quantity by uh, the count of nodal components contained in at least one of these smaller boxes. So taking expectation of this, uh, what we find is, uh, okay, so what is this? Uh, because we are assuming that uh, the distribution of F is uh, translation invariant. So the distribution of the function, say for example, in this box, and in this box are the same. So uh, the expected uh, number of nodal components in both these boxes are the same. So in fact, uh, the expected number of nodal components in all these styling boxes are the same. And there are R square over L square many of these boxes. So that is how we get uh, this inequality here. Uh, similarly, uh, we have this uh, inequality, oh, sorry, uh, this term here. Uh, plus the expected number of nodal components, which are not contained in any of these smaller tiling boxes. Okay, so how do we uh, deal with uh, this term here? So we find that if there is a red component, if it's not contained in any of these smaller boxes, it should necessarily intersect one of these finitely many horizontal or vertical lines. So we can write uh, a simple inequality of this form, uh, the number of nodal components uh, which are not contained in any of these smaller tiling boxes is bounded above by the number of zeros of the function when we restrict the function to these uh, horizontal, sorry, uh, these uh, vertical and these horizontal lines. Uh, since F is a uh, stationary Gaussian process, if, you, if we restrict it to any of these uh, horizontal or vertical lines, we are again going to get a station, one dimensional stationary Gaussian process. And uh, it's uh, very well known that uh, the number of zeros of a one-dimensional stationary Gaussian process, uh, the expected number of the zeros is proportional to the uh, length of the interval. In this case, it is uh, 2R. And there are uh, constant times R over L many of these uh, horizontal and vertical lines. So we get an upper bound of uh, R square over L for uh, this quantity here. So that is how uh, we get uh, this inequality. So we see that uh, from here, we can conclude that uh, expectation of NR over R square is a Cauchy sequence and hence it converges to some um, uh, non-negative non constant. So uh, this step here, uh, where we bound the number of nodal components not contained in any of these uh, uh, tiling boxes by uh, by this factor here is the semi-locality argument in this situation. Uh, 
So we see that even to conclude something very simple about uh, the nodal component count, we need a semi-locality argument. So uh, in other situations, the semi-locality arguments are, uh, are, are more complicated or more difficult. Um, all right. So now uh, I want to uh, say a few things about uh, the random functions which we study and uh, some of the results which are known about them. So I already spoke about uh, the random plane wave. So let me first uh, define what it is informally. So this is R2. Uh, take the uh, unit circle S1 and uh, consider n angularly equispaced points on S1. And uh, we look at this uh, random function, Fn. So this is a linear combination of these plane waves. Uh, so this is just the usual uh, inner product in R2. So these are, uh, so this and this are plane waves uh, in R2 propagating along the direction AJ. And uh, these, uh, uh, these factors in front of uh, these plane waves are uh, independent uh, normal zero one random variables. So, uh, in, so the random plane wave is in some sense a limit of uh, these random functions as n tends to infinity. So it's easy to see that almost surely uh, fn satisfy this Helmholtz equation. And uh, the random plane wave is also a random function which satisfies uh, the same equation. More formally, the random plane wave is a centered stationary Gaussian process on R2 whose spectral measure is the uniform measure on S1. So uh, what do we want to study about uh, this random function? Uh, we want to study, okay, the following are just uh, uh, two of the many interesting properties which can be studied about uh, the nodal set of random plane wave. The first one is NR. It is the number of nodal components of F contained in this box, sorry, in this ball BR, which is centered at the origin. So we will let R tend to infinity and we want to uh, study this uh, random variable. Uh, the next is LR, which is the uh, length of the nodal set contained in this uh, large ball. We will let R, again, R tend to infinity and study this random variable. So uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, uh, let me tell you like what sort of questions uh, people have studied and uh, some of the questions we uh, study in our work. So uh, let's first talk about something which is simple and uh, which uh, which is probably known to most of us. So if we consider uh, a collection of uh, IID um, random variables, uh, say whose first two moments are finite. Uh, so there are a lot of results known about uh, sums of uh, such IID uh, random variables. We know the law of large number result, which says that uh, SN appropriately N converges almost surely to uh, zero, and we know uh, the central limit theorem, which gives uh, which gives an idea of how SN fluctuates at uh, this scale, uh, square root of the variance around its mean, which is n mu. And uh, we also know uh, large deviation or exponential concentration results under some extra assumptions on uh, the distribution of uh, each of these Xi's. So uh, this is what is known. Uh, so what do we study, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, what are the quantity, uh, so what about uh, this nodal length and uh, these uh, nodal component counts which are studied uh, the random plane wave. So uh, there has been, so uh, there is an analogous result to the law of large number result which we know in this situation, in this case also. So it has been shown that uh, LR over R square converges almost surely and an L1 to a constant. Uh, it's also shown that NR over R square converges almost surely and an L1 to a constant. So these can be viewed as uh, law of large number results. Uh, the only stark difference between uh, these two cases is, uh, okay, in the case of nodal length, we saw that it can be written as a sum of nodal length in uh, smaller subregions, but, uh, the uh, lengths in two different uh, subregions are not independent. They are, in fact, highly correlated. So it's not as easy as uh, studying uh, uh, the uh, sum of independent random variables. 
Okay, so uh, what else is known? Uh, there is a, a CLT which is known for uh, the nodal length. Uh, there's no CLT which is uh, known for the uh, nodal component count. There are no large deviation or uh, exponential concentration results known for the nodal length. Uh, we do have a exponential concentration result for the uh, nodal component count for this particular uh, random function, the random plane wave. Okay. So uh, what are the results which are known for the random plane wave? Uh, so uh, the random plane wave being an ergodic process, it follows as a result of uh, Wiener's ergodic theorem that uh, the following law of large number result holds. So this is a work of uh, Nazarov and Soden. Uh, at this point, I should say that uh, Nazarov and Soden are the pioneers of uh, this area and uh, most of the other results are actually uh, built on their uh, work or uh, they are highly inspired from uh, their work. So they show that uh, NR over R square converges almost surely and an L1 to a positive constant. So the following is our result. Uh, we show that in fact, NR over R square uh, concentrates exponentially around uh, this positive constant. So uh, this result, as I said, uh, and the proof is heavily inspired by a related work of uh, Nazarov and Soden. And uh, the main tool used in uh, showing this exponential concentration result is the uh, Gaussian concentration result. Okay, um, so in interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, these two slides and maybe uh, move on to the uh, next random function, which I want to talk about. Uh, so these are called uh, random spherical harmonics. These are the uh, random Laplace eigenfunctions on the two-dimensional sphere S2. So on S2, it is known that the eigenvalues of the Laplacian or of this form, n into n plus 1, and uh, the corresponding eigenspace is a 2n plus 1 dimensional um, space uh, of uh, degree n spherical harmonics, which are just the restriction uh, to S2 of uh, degree n homogeneous harmonic polynomials. So how do we randomize uh, how, how do we randomize uh, this space of uh, uh, Laplace eigenfunctions? So we fix an orthonormal, there's a natural way to do this. Uh, we fix an orthonormal basis for uh, each n uh, with respect to the L2, uh, uh, L2 inner product. Uh, and uh, we consider this uh, uh, linear combination of uh, uh, these uh, orthonormal bases. So these uh, xi i's here are uh, id normal zero one random variables. So this is the uh, standard Gaussian measure on this two n plus one dimensional uh, Hilbert space. So this is called this is what is called the random spherical harmonic of degree n. And again, uh, the quantity of interest is the uh, total number of nodal components of uh, this random uh, function f n. Okay, so uh, at this point, I want to say that uh, Kuran's nodal domain theorem uh, implies that uh, the number of nodal components of uh, any function f in Hn is bounded below by one and it is bounded above by n square. So uh, there are uh, functions for which the number of uh, nodal uh, domains is just two. So it can be as small as two. And there are a lot of examples where uh, the number of uh, nodal domains is of the order of n square. So we see that there is a huge variability in uh, the total uh, nodal count in this case. Mm, so what Nazarov and Soden, uh, so this is their first work. Um, so what they showed in uh, 2009 is that uh, this quantity in uh, the number of uh, nodal components of the random uh, of the degree and uh, random spherical harmonic uh, appropriately uh, normalized concentrates exponentially around a positive constant okay so what do we do uh, so like i already mentioned uh, there's a lot of interest in studying uh, the behavior of uh, these uh, laplace eigenfunctions at the wavelength scale so what we do is we consider the same uh, uh, random spherical harmonic, but at the wavelength scale. So uh, we fix uh, P to be uh, the any point in S2. So let's fix it to be the North Pole. And we look at uh, geodesic balls uh, 
on S2, which are uh, which are of this type with the radius Rn over uh, square root lambda n, where Rn should, is any sequence which tends to infinity. So we prove uh, exponential concentration for uh, the count of uh, nodal components which are contained in this uh, small geodesic ball around this uh, same positive constant. So this can be viewed as a local version of uh, Nazarov and Soden's result. Uh, and I think uh, my time is over and I will stop here. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Lakshmi Priya. Uh, uh, yeah, you have stopped exactly at 30 minutes. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. And I would like to invite questions now. Sorry, I have a very naive question. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you told, you showed a way to get an upper bound on the number of these nodal things by looking at vertical lines and seeing how many zeros are there of a function, etc. Right? Uh -huh. Nodal comp components, that is. How right. would you get a lower bound? So, uh, okay, we just sum the total number of uh, nodal components which are contained in each of these smaller tiling boxes. And how would you know those? So, uh, okay, I'm, uh, so I'm assuming that uh, this process has some very special symmetry properties, which is that it is stationary. So uh, the distribution of the function is translation invariant. So uh, the distribution of the function in this box is the same as the distribution of the function in this box. Okay. So uh, the expected number of uh, nodal components in both these boxes are the same. Huh. So if I just look at the expectation of this, uh, the expected number in all these styling boxes are in fact the same, which is what I uh, denote by expectation of NL. Right. And there are R square over L square many boxes. Right. Nice. Yeah, so this is like a very simple example. So, uh, this is just to illustrate that even in this uh, simple example, we do need uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, argument to say that the nodal component count is actually a semi-local quantity. But if you want to prove exponential concentration results, some other arguments are required. Yeah, I have a question uh -huh. about your last result on random spherical harmonics. Yes. Is it restricted to only spherical harmonics or SN? Or can you replace SN by more general compact symmetric spaces? Okay, so that's a very good question. So we have a similar result for uh, the torus. Okay. Uh, actually, a similar result of this kind, like uh, the global uh, nodal domain count on the torus is also known. So uh, we also prove a local version of that result. But... Uh, we don't even have a global result for any other uh, uh, general manifolds, uh, uh, an exponential concentration result for any other general manifolds. So it is, uh, it is difficult to expect to get a local result in such cases. I mean, it is known that in expectation, uh, the number oh, of... It Sorry? No, is it, is it restricted to only S2 or at least SN or SN or any N is not known? Um, no, you I have mean, stated I, the result. For, right, I can't right. hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so what I said is uh, we, there is uh, an analogous result. Uh, no, there like was some this. problem with. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? So can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So what's, what yeah. I said is there is an analogous result like this for the torus also, the two-dimensional torus and higher dimensional torus. And uh, we show that uh, such a local result, uh, local concentration result uh, holds for the two-dimensional torus, uh, not the higher dimensional torus. Um, uh, this result is true for uh, higher dimensional uh, yeah. spheres as well. But uh, what we have is only for the two-dimensional uh, torus and the two-dimensional sphere. Uh, proving things like this in arbitrary uh, compact manifolds is difficult because here uh, we do use uh, 
we i mean we do use the fact that uh, uh, these laplace explicit we know what these laplace eigen functions are going to be for example in the sphere we do know that these are just going to be spherical harmonics and uh, similar case for the torus too Okay. So does it answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Lakshmi. Uh, so Hello. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, since you say even for SN, uh, uh, you don't, uh, there doesn't seem to be like, uh, since you don't know the global uh, aspect of the problem. So uh, I was wondering if there is some hope of uh, having, I mean, in future once, uh, uh, theory is in place to have a uniform proof for all the space forms where the uh, sectional curvature, like complete simply connected uh, Riemannian manifolds, whose sectional curvature is constant, or maybe even beyond that, the symmetric spaces uh, where uh, the isometric group acts transitively. So, does the geometry of the uh, manifold uh, mm -hmm. play any role in getting this uh, local or semi local analysis that you are doing? Uh, is my question. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, okay. First, I want to probably uh, uh, say something. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, what I said is it is known for SN. So okay. this particular result is known for uh, SN in all dimensions. Okay. We did not prove it for all dimensions. We just did it for uh, dimension two. Probably it's true for higher dimensions also. Mm -hmm. And uh, like the answer I can give you. Uh, is almost similar to the answer I gave uh, Professor Tangabelu. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the fact that we know what these uh, eigenfunctions are helps a lot in uh, this analysis. Mm -hmm. So on general manifolds, uh, we do not know explicitly what the eigenfunctions are. Um, so I, I don't know, like, uh, yeah, my answer is probably that's a, that's a difficult uh, question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Lakshmi Priya. Yes. Thank so, you. Yeah. So I I just wanted to add one remark that Lakshmi Priya was our student at ISAR Pune, right? Uh, yes. I, yes. I think you were almost completing when I had just joined ISAR Pune. So yeah. Very uh -huh. proud to see your progress. Yeah. All the very best for your future. Thank you. Thank you. Any further question? So thank you, Lakshmi. Your nice talk uh, attracted many questions, I, as you could see. So, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for your attention and for all the questions. Yeah.